Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today for another live stream with Heritage Classical Academy of All Things Classical. And we are continuing with our series on racism and the classics, a very exciting series that Heritage Classical Academy hosts uh, for free for all of our viewers. We uh, get a lot of, um, a, a lot of emails and uh, replies from parents asking us, how can we answer the argument whether classical education or the classics, uh, the classics, excuse me, are racist? And uh, we figured, well, why not bring in some scholars and intellectuals who can actually talk to this for us? And we have an exciting guest for us here today. But before we bring her on, there are a couple of things that I do want to cover with you before moving forward. And the first item is... Um, because Heritage Classical Academy does this as a community service, all we ask in return from our viewers and listeners is that they follow us. You'll notice up on the screen our Twitter handle, our Facebook handle, as well as Instagram. And of course, we are on YouTube. So give us a follow and click on that bell so that you get notifications every time that we post a video or we go live. We're going to be producing some great content, ladies and gentlemen, and you do not want to miss out. Uh, the second thing is, at the end of this interview, we're going to transition back to this page where I will give you some announcements on, on what you can expect moving forward. So stay with us. And now, for the reason you're here, let's begin. Dr. Angel Adams Parham is Associate Professor of Sociology and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at the University of Virginia. Her research is in the area of historical sociology, where she engages in research and writing that examine the past in order to better understand how to live well in the present and envision wisely for the future. This research focus is rooted in her interest in reconnecting sociology to its classical roots so that sociology is understood to be a kind of public philosophy animated by questions such as, what is a good society? and what kinds of social arrangements are most conducive to human flourishing. Dr. Parham is author of American Roots, Racial Palimpsests, and the Transformation of Race, Oxford 2017. And Dr. Parham, real fast, uh, can our viewers find your book on Amazon? Yes, they can. Fantastic. Okay, we'll make sure to put that link up on this interview so that anyone who's watching can just click on it in order to order it, which that's exciting. She has, the book has won local and national awards. Dr. Parham is also engaged in much public facing work and in this capacity, she is the co-founder and executive director of Nianza Classical Community, an organization which provides curricula and programming designed to connect with students from diverse backgrounds, inviting them to take part in the great conversation, cultivate the moral imagination and pursue truth, goodness, and beauty. Again, she is co-author with Dr. Anika Prother of the Black Intellectual Tradition, Reading Freedom in Classical Literature, which is being published by Classical Academic Press and appears in June 2022. Whew. All right. Welcome to the show, Dr. Parham. Thank you so much. Um, how are you? Doing well, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for um, honoring us with your presence. Uh, something that our viewers don't know yet is that you are part of our advisory board uh, for Heritage Classical Academy, and we are so honored that you have decided to help us as we pursue the goal and the dream of having a small classical school for free in Houston, Texas. So once again, thank you for that. And I have a set of questions for you today. Some of them uh, range in uh, level of challenge or difficulty, but I cannot wait to uh, pick your brain. But first, let me ask you something a little more personal. All of us come to the classics uh, from different paths, and every story is fascinating. And I find that uh, each one of our stories says something about who we are. I'd like to know more about Dr. Parham. And what brought her to the classics? Well, absolutely. It's it's actually really quite a story. <laughs> so, <laughs> Great. Uh, I, I came um, kind of in a roundabout way, actually. Mm. Um, 
I, I think I always had an intrinsic interest. And I say that just because I actually started out as an English major in college initially mm -hmm. and was very drawn to Shakespeare and Chaucer and so on. Um, as a result of, of several issues, which I can get into later if there's any interest having to do with <laughs> academia and its particular organization in some of our humanities, mm -hmm. um, I decided to make a switch from English to sociology. Wow. So that was one time, and I actually started Latin my first year of college. So okay. I was on the track to do it. <laughs> and there were just a number of factors that took me off of that, um, which is really too bad. Mm. But I think I, already, I always had an intrinsic interest. So fast forward three sociology degrees later. <laughs> wow, three. That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of schoolwork. <laughs> it's a lot of sociology. Um, so <laughs> I then have my two beautiful daughters mm -hmm. and we are thinking about how we're going to educate them. And education is so important to me. I cannot express how important education is to me, not only for my children, but for all of our children. It's, it's a real passion for me. So mm -hmm. when it came to thinking about how to educate my children, um, we decided to homeschool and my husband was incredibly supportive. Um, I was working full time as a professor, just like I'm working full time now, but we were able to make it work, for which I'm very grateful. Wow. So we homeschooled um, from the beginning for 11 years. We only stopped last August um, because I transitioned to a new position at the University of Virginia and was just taking on a lot more responsibility. Um, and so now they're in a wonderful class classical Christian school. But it was while I was homeschooling them that I was introduced to classical education. And it was another homeschool mom, um, Danielle Bennett Dukes, who many of your listeners will probably know, mm. who invited me to a classical conversations meeting. And I was just hooked from the beginning. I wow. said, this wow. is what I want for my children. So I started reading these classics with my children. And my first um, engagement with Homer was with them. So I had never read wow. Homer before. So it was a children's version of Homer's Odyssey. It was my first engagement. So real quickly, just to clarify then, so you you had something kind of pulling you towards it back when you were getting your degrees, but it wasn't until you decided, well, how are we going to educate our own children that you really just went deep into the classics. Is that right? That is correct. That okay, is correct. interesting, interesting. Yes. What yes. appealed to you about it as you were walking your daughters through the whole process? What is it that said and clicked, I have to have this and, and I have to, which we're going to be talking about in just a moment, I have to talk about it all the time now. So, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Go ahead and <laughs> uh, what sure. appealed to you? Yes. Yeah. So I think one, one of the first things is just the appeal of literature. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was always lost in literature when I was growing up, just loved it. And just the excellence of the literature that I was reading with my daughters, um, you know, Beautiful. the imaginative life that it was cultivating. And what was so fun for me as a homeschool mom is I would sit down with my children when they were three and six, and we would be reading, you know, this beautiful literature and we would have basically similar conversations, you know, wow. about what was happening and different themes. And from a very young age, they were able to engage, you know, at their age level um, with the stories. So the stories and the high quality of the literature, the pedagogically, the emphasis on memorization, yes. wow. um, you know, which many people think, oh, that's you know, it's so stodgy and old fashioned. It depends on how you go about it. Mm -hmm. um, but Many classical schools have very engaging ways of doing this memory work. So for instance, my youngest daughter now, mm -hmm. um, she is in seventh grade. And so this is the first year that she's doing really full scale Latin. We had done wow. a little bit before, mm -hmm. um, but she has been incredibly assisted because in classical conversations, they have these little songs and jingles to learn the declensions. Yes. And so they're not studying, you know, full scale Latin, but they're just singing for years. She's been singing these declensions. <laughs> and there's another girl in her class who was also part of CC before going to the school. Um, and they both, you know, like 
they will say, oh my gosh, like this is so easy. And they wonder why, you know, other people are having trouble with it, but they just go and just sing these declensions. So, you know, the power of memory, the imagination, the literature, um, it's, it's just a wonderful way to immerse yourself in learning. That's beautiful. So um, how many years have your daughters been doing the, uh, for our audience real fast, Classical Conversations, or CC, is mm -hmm. a homeschool style, um, perhaps not co-op, I, I don't think they like the term co-op, but it's, it's kind of a homeschool style um, classical curriculum, is that correct? And then how long have they been doing it? Have you been using it now? So... If I am counting correctly, I believe we were in CC for eight years. Eight years. Yes. Wow. So it's, a, it's a pretty good long time. Yes. And, and CC is everywhere, correct? It's not just in Texas or uh, over in the East Coast where you are right now, but it's pretty much, I think they've established themselves all across 50, all 50 states. As far as I know, yeah, I, I believe there are CCs almost everywhere. I think they might even have some international Wow. As well. Yeah. Wow. So it, it was very good for us. Excellent. I'm going to ask you some questions about that more, more on the practical side, because I know some parents are going to be interested in, well, if I'm going to do this myself with my children, especially when it comes to Latin, it sounds very intimidating. A lot of our families, including myself, we didn't have a, a Latin background, and then we kind of just got plunged into it, and now we love it. So I have questions about that. However, first, I'm very curious, had you heard about the classical education before CC, and was it in a positive or a negative light, or if you had not heard about it before, um, did you find yourself already having certain prejudices towards it? Were you were you open to the idea? Um, I'm interested in the cultural uh, background of your approach to the classics. Well, so I, I'm afraid I have a very politically boring story. Um, I <laughs> no such that... thing. No <laughs> such thing with politics. <laughs> Go I mean, ahead. There, there weren't really any cultural politics in it for me. Okay, um, okay. You know, Danielle invited me to the meeting. I, I saw some pedagogy and content that I thought was just fantastic. Wow. I wanted it for my young daughters. And I said, this is, this is the way we're going. Now, I will Fantastic. say this. Okay. Um, so as I thought about classical education and thought about the content, now the thing about um, CC is that they don't choose all the readings for you. Mm. Um, it's not until the children are at the challenge level starting in seventh grade that CC then sets the reading curriculum. Interesting. Um, okay. So up until seventh grade, um, I had, you know, full, um, kind of rain to decide what they were going to be reading wow. um, in terms of their literature. And so I was very conscious that I wanted them to be reading uh, diverse voices as well as the core of classical and canonical literature. I wanted mm -hmm. them to have both. Um, so I'd say that that's maybe kind of the one thing, but I... I think that's just more a reflection of who I am mm -hmm. rather than some kind of, you know, political reaction to sure. classical education. Um, no, I didn't really start hearing about all of that until I got more involved in the renewal and started hearing, you know, people <laughs> talking and people criticizing it. Oh, yes. How but controversial this whole thing, this whole thing is, right? right. I want to jump into that real fast because I think that um, our audience could really benefit and um, as myself, just to hearing from your point of view and, and with your wisdom, with your background in sociology, how can we uh, learn in regards to the classics and how can we speak about the classics in a way that will um, actually bring people to what it really is, right? As opposed to everything that we hear around us, all the controversy. I want to get through all of that and get to the heart of the matter. Um, so when you hear, uh, Dr. Parham, when you hear someone say that the classics are racist, um, what is your response? How do you, um, what are your thoughts on that? So my response is to think, okay, you know, so there's my personal response and then there's what I might actually say. <laughs> okay. I like that. Very wise. <laughs> my, my personal thought to myself mm -hmm. is that this needs to better understand history and have a better grounding um, 
in the great conversation. Because mm. if you had that background, you would understand that this has been a conversation that has been going on since antiquity, and there have been diverse voices involved. Okay. Now, that said, um, it is certainly possible for um, someone to frame yes. the classics as being mainly Western, European, and white. Absolutely. That has absolutely happened. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's one of these things where, you know, with just about anything, I think this is true, yes. you have to find out for yourself. Don't let someone else kind of sketch a picture for you and just accept that picture yes. because it's just not the full story. Um, mm. It is very possible. I tend to think in terms of um, crossroads and conversations mm -hmm. when I think about um, the classics. And I'll also say, you know, so there, there are different, you know, kind of dimensions. So if we talk about classics as a discipline at the university level, that is something different than classical education. There's some overlap, but it's not exactly yes. the same thing. And then, of course, um, there's a difference between classic classical literature of antiquity and canonical literature, you know, which is also part of classical education, but is not from classical antiquity. So, but they yes. all kind of get, you know, mixed up together. Yes. Um, but I think the, the key thing is. I, I can you can use the term classical and canonical learning or literature. Do you have a quick way to break that down for the audience so that we know um, this is how I think of classical uh, um, in an official capacity. This is how I think of canonical or the canon as part of being the cl uh, the classical education as a whole. And then you also mentioned a conversation that's been happening since antiquity. Uh, maybe you can tie it in with that as well so our audience understands um, what is this thing that we mean when we say there's a conversation that's been happening that does have a lot of diverse voices, but perhaps um, some institutions or some cultural things have limited or kept some of those other speakers into the conversation from participating fully in a way that it looks like we're moving in that direction today. But I'll, but I'll let you go ahead and, and talk to us about that. So when I, I, you know, the classics or, or classical antiquity, I'm thinking in terms of um, Greek and Roman antiquity, yes. for instance, right? At least if we're looking at the Western tradition, if we were looking at the Chinese tradition, that would be a different kind of classical period. But in the Western mm -hmm. tradition, um, it's generally Greek and Roman antiquity, and the authors during that time would be the classics. Great. And classics as a discipline at the university level would be focused on those civilizations and their literatures. Yes. Canonical, um, we're talking about writings that have been enduring and that have been considered to be the best or among the best to have been written. Mm -hmm. And that generally includes classic literature from antiquity yes. but it goes beyond that you know so mm -hmm. it would include shakespeare for instance who was certainly not living in classical antiquity it would include milton you know it would include all of these others who have been at the core of the canon um for hundreds of years mm -hmm. right when we talk about classical education and the classical renewal it would include both of those it would include works from classical antiquity and it would include canonical literature Got it. so um yes yeah, so that's that's what i mean and is that where you think the the controversy starts with the canon as opposed to the classics or does it also include the classics as well? Um, <laughs> where do you think it begins? To me, in my conversations with colleagues and others who um, are interested in exploring these ideas, it seems like the big issue, especially for uh, a 21st century American democratic individual, the thought of ha you know someone choosing the canon seems so anti-democratic that I almost I almost feel that it's a cultural reaction against any type of um, hierarchy, whether it be in the arts or in literature or um, even cuisine, which is interesting, right? You, you, you see that there are better chefs than others, but there's a guttural, there's this gut reaction towards it. Do you think the controversy starts with the canon or does it extend to the classics as well? 
So the canon includes the classics. Mm -hmm. So um, I think probably the easiest way to think about it is it's wars around the canon, you know, and what mm -hmm. should or should not be part of the canon. And one of the kind of more famous or some yeah. would say infamous books was The Closing of the American Mind <laughs> by Alan Bloom, <laughs> you know, where, um, yes, he, he had very definite opinions, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on mm -hmm. the side of the canon yes. and was very chagrined to see that there was not, you know, kind of universal embrace of that idea. Um, his book comes out in the mid 1980s, but mm. well before that there had been um, really um, a, a kind of resistance to this idea of a canon that was mainly consisting of Western European writers and, um, you know, white American writers and yes. so on. And it was during the, the the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, for instance, that you saw the rise of, of different kinds of ethnic studies, yes. right? That challenged the idea of a core mm -hmm. canon that did not include many racial and ethnic minorities. Now, I will back up here to say that I yes. think that that move was a, an important step on our way in that there were legitimately many voices mm -hmm. that were excellent that had not been recognized. Mm -hmm. It has been useful to have African-American studies programs where you get real serious expertise. For instance, um, Henry Louis Gates has done a lot of work on Phyllis Wheatley and on yes. rescuing her work and bringing it, packaging it, bringing it all together. You know, she is certainly someone who should be part of the canon, yes. but hasn't been, but it took scholars in African-American studies to get these voices and pull them yes. together and say, look at some of the voices we've overlooked who are truly excellent. So I think that was a necessary move, Good. you know, along the way to say, maybe there are some voices that we haven't heard of. Um, to give you a musical um, kind of corollary to this, yes. Everyone knows of Mozart, yes. but very few people know of Joseph Boulogne, Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges, mm. who was born in, it was either Martinique or Guadeloupe. Was he contemporary um, with Mozart, right? He was contemporary yes. with Mozart yes. in the 18th century, and he had a French father and a black mother. Yes. His father took him to France. He excelled in fencing and Amazing. violin playing and became a noted composer. He was at the wow. top, top echelons of France. And there is some evidence that Mozart certainly knew of him. I mean, yes. he was a phenomenon. He was a prodigy. Amazing. Just about nobody knows anything about him. So what I'm saying is mm -hmm. that we should not have a knee-jerk reaction to those ethnic studies programs that have brought those voices forward. Mm -hmm. On the other hand... <laughs> okay, let's hear the other hand. Think, yes. On the other hand, while I think that was absolutely crucial and we mm -hmm. do need experts um, who are saying, I'm going to focus on the black intellectual tradition and, and that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely necessary. Um, that should not come at the expense of studying the canon, Interesting. right? Okay. The, the canon as a broad area that has been largely Western European and largely white, but because of the work of great scholars doing this kind of ethnic studies, African-American studies, it's becoming clearer and clearer who else has been part of that conversation yes. already. There's a yes. difference between saying, well, for diversity's sake, we need to kind of check some boxes and throw in a, and throw and mix, you know, some more people of color in there, um, just willy nilly. The <laughs> oh, difference no. between that yes. and saying, well, these folks were classically educated and were already part of an ongoing conversation, yes. and we're just recognizing that and including them in that canonical conversation. I want to, uh, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit more about that because um, I'm, I'm wondering how you would um, respond to uh, the following statement. If It seems like a lot of the, <clears throat> the canon as it's been established over the course of many decades now, um, extends all the way back to the founding, say, of, um, of our country. Um, that was a very clear, um, a very clear uh, removing of certain voices from that, from that canon. I think American children were being raised in a very specific way with very specific authors and literature. And um, so the statement is this, what we are seeing now is a vestige of that. 
but it doesn't have to be that way. In other words, the, the canon doesn't in, in it intrinsically doesn't set the rules to where, say, voices like James Baldwin or Frederick Douglass or uh, Martin Luther King Jr. can't be included in them. I mean, this is the best that's been produced. One of my favorite heroes, uh, Frederick Douglass, who is an incredible orator, some of the best speeches I have ever read. So uh, would you agree with that statement? Would you qualify it? Would you prove it? <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. No, I think that's true. Um, I, mm -hmm. I think, frankly, that, you know, the 19th century, early 20th century, um, Black writers were not considered to be worthy of consideration for mm -hmm. the most part. You know, of course, Frederick Douglass was very well respected and yes. so on. So there, there were exceptions here and there. But for the most part, I just think there wasn't an interest, right? And um, I think part of what is good about now that there has been a change in that sentiment um, mm -hmm. to see that there are stories and voices out there that are truly excellent, that reach these pinnacles of excellence, yeah. and that absolutely are already part of the conversation and so deserve to be recognized for the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely correct. It doesn't have to be something where these other voices are excised. That's not how it has to be. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no reason for it to be that way. On the other hand, um, as you were getting, you were alluding to issues of judgment, you mm -hmm. know, of some things being better than others. Mm -hmm. um, it's absolutely crucial that we train taste and judgment. Yes. Um, no, not everyone likes that, but <laughs> I, I, I do think mm -hmm. it's important. And the, the other thing that I also really believe in is being very deeply steeped in a tradition. Mm. Um, so it, it's very hard to go forth in the world and be able to be have a sense of who you are. Yes. Um, yes. If you are constantly saying you want to change everything, but you really have no sense of what has been, you know, what conversations have already happened like there's nothing new under the sun other yes. people before you have already contemplated this mm -hmm. why don't we learn from them rather than rushing out to try to change everything absolutely that doesn't mean that there won't be some things that change but we have to understand foundations so this is what i find uh, so fascinating about um uh, everything you've said so far and your position on this matter because Instead of saying, well, here I have a whole new tradition, why don't we just eschew the old one and start or pursue a different one, which is more uh, diversified and includes more minority voices, it sounds like you're saying, no, this is part of the conversation that's already been having, and you're, you're kind of a defender now of the whole canon and the classics and the new voices. Is that is that an accurate representation, Dr. Parham? And, and why would you uh, take that position, which is so controversial? That is absolutely true. That's absolutely okay. true. So again, you know, one does not have to embrace everything that the West has done. There, there are, absolutely you know, true. I don't think you need to embrace the whole of what any society. <laughs> absolutely, correct, has done. yes. I wouldn't advise it. Um, but if you're going to critique, you need to know what you're talking about, which means you need to read and read not with um, an attitude toward, I'm going to disagree with everything Aristotle has to say, you know, but <laughs> it's read, you know, mm -hmm. kind of with some sympathy to try to really, and some humility to try to really understand what's being said. Mm -hmm. um, if you are the kind of person who really wants to engage in critique, at least let it be informed, intelligent Beautiful. critique, yes. where you know what you're talking about. Um, so I think that's very, very important. And again, to come back to a tradition and being rooted in a tradition, um, I, I just believe that it's very difficult to have a, a true sense of mm -hmm. self and purpose without having a firm foundation in a tradition. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on one's background, one may grow up steeped in more than one tradition. Yes. So for instance, with mm -hmm. my own daughters, um, I wanted them early on, they wanted to do dance and I said, okay, you know, the go-to is ballet. We'll yes. get to that. I want you to start with African dance. African okay, dance, beautiful. Um, many different kinds of African dance. They have been, they had been doing West 
and African dance. And they did that for many, many years. My youngest did it for eight years. We're on the lookout for her to continue it here, just really getting steeped in that tradition, a real respect for it. And then they also did ballet later. But for me, I respect African dance, various forms of African dance as deep traditions that have a lot to teach us. And I feel the same way about the Western canon something very deep there to be respected. You don't have to embrace everything, but you have to be humble and willing to learn before you try to engage in critique. <clears throat> when it comes to um, texts and what should be read and what should not be read, we, we see a lot of texts being canceled today. Um, they're being removed from the classroom, either because of um, some of the language, obviously, and then uh, obviously some of the very uh, terrible depictions on how other humans have been treated, uh, especially African-Americans. Um, what uh, position do you take on that? And for parents who are reading, just the other day I was reading to my daughter, um, The Courage of Sarah Noble. And uh, Sarah Noble, Right, and my daughter's seven years old. Sarah Noble is afraid of the Native Americans. She she thinks. Um, I think it even says there's a term there that calls them savages. And and, and there is a moment in which, okay, I'm here with my seven year old reading this. Um, how how as a parent do we just simply avoid those books? Uh, are there books that definitely need to be avoided or? Um, can I use some of these books to teach some of these? This is a very, uh, as you know, it's a very difficult conversation right now happening in academia as well as at the K-12 level. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts, Dr. Parham? I think it depends on the book and okay. how important and central it has been. Um, but in, in that case, I also think, here's the thing, people seem to want to have absolute safety and <laughs> in everything <laughs> like I cannot guarantee you will always be safe and, and everything will be sanitized. So the thing to do is to start with young children having age appropriate conversations about difficult aspects of our history. If you're not going to do it when they're young, how on earth are they going to learn to do this well as they get Excellent. older? So my inclination has always been to read that literature. Now that said, I don't know that I want to, you know, kind of suffuse or overwhelm my child with readings about savages, yes. because after a while, you know, that yes. starts to stick as the way you think about Native American people. Yes. So I think there's a reasonable balance, right? Mm -hmm. So I would tend to think, okay, so we read about Noble. I think about the um, Little House series, which I grew up reading and I read to my daughters over a number of years, and it's similar, you know, yes. and not very nice attitude toward Native Americans, um, but we would pause, we would have a conversation, you know, so why do you think Ma and Pa are saying that, you know? Mm -hmm. What do you think the Native Americans' perspective on this is? And then also pairing that with reading, perhaps, say, a children's book by Louise Erdrich, who okay. is a Native American author, and in her work, you get to see, um, I'm blanking on the title right now, but it's a little Native girl and her perspective on white explorers coming, right? Wow. And so wow. you can read these mm. things in dialogue. I'm a very big proponent of reading in dialogue um, between traditions and between voices, because that's where you get more perspective. Yes. Um, it's very unimaginative to just chop things out of the curriculum. And it does not help to train our children to think carefully, well, and critically, and to be able to deal um, mm -hmm. with wisdom with Excellent. very difficult issues. So uh, real quickly, I just want, for the sake of our audience, um, our viewers and our listeners, um, Sarah Noble, the book, is a book I would recommend. In fact, um, in the in the end, the dad, the John Noble, is the one who teaches Sarah that her views of Native Americans is uh, very skewed and wrong. So it's actually a very nice book in terms of teaching children. Um, uh, you might have the wrong idea of what Native Americans are, and let me show you the truth about um, this wonderful uh, tribe of people who are actually here to help us, um, as is depicted in the book. So I wanted to quickly just say that real fast. Uh, I also want to really quickly uh, remind our viewers to like, 
follow, um, retweet this uh, interview that we're having right now, whether you're on Twitter or on YouTube, click on that bell so you get notifications. Uh, you help us by your follows and your likes. One last thing, you can also start, uh, we have a chat box and you can um, welcome or send your love to uh, Dr. Parham, who is here with us today. If you'd like to, we can also feature your chats uh, on our screen. Uh, Dr. Parham, real, real quick, I have a question about um, how the classical education movement has kind of, uh, is booming, right? So you're talking about the uh, classical education renewal, how you're part of that, and, and you're spearheading this um this movement that is just spreading like wildfire, which is so encouraging to see. But I've also, I have, I have to say that um, it seems to me that it's mostly popular among uh, evangelicals, and it's also popular among conservatives. And what I don't understand, and maybe you can help me understand this, is uh, why isn't that liberals uh, aren't more enthused by this and uh, what can we do to change that? Because I do believe this is something that it benefits everyone, is for everyone. This is a, in my mind, a truly universal kind of education. But I might be wrong. So I'm, I'm very open to learning from you, <laughs> Dr. Farah. Yeah, interesting question. <laughs> well, so I guess, first of all, that mm -hmm. there's probably an inherently conservative aspect of... Mm you know, the classics and the, and the canon, right? Oh, yeah. You know, as in conserving the past or yes, conserving the past, yes. building on the, the foundation. Um, so I think there is something inherently conservative in it, yes. you know, just to be fair. Um, and so it does make sense that it would appeal to people who are conservative or conservative leaning. Absolutely. Mm. Now, um, as to those who might identify as being more progressive or liberal, mm -hmm. um, I would say again, you know, so the, the focus is often on critique and the, the focus is on voices that have been left out. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with either, with critique or with focusing on voices that have been left out or with focusing on justice. I think those are all important things. Yeah. But again, I guess what I would argue for in the case of liberals and progressives um, mm -hmm. is the importance of being well rooted in what you're actually critiquing. Yeah. Um, and so if you're going to critique, you know, a situation or a society, I think you also need to be looking at our founding documents, for example. Yeah. Um, so for instance, I know that there's, um, often there's a, a real critique of certain parts of the Constitution, um, which Frederick Douglass, by the way, had this critique, that there were certain parts of it that really were supporting slavery, like mm -hmm. the Three-Fifths Compromise, for instance, mm -hmm. um, the reasons that the Electoral College was founded. Um, and so for a very long time, he said, you know, this is just no good. We need to throw this out and start all over again. But as a result of some thinking and careful conversations, he began to reconsider that and to say, you know what, um, there really is a foundation for freedom here um, if we read and implement this correctly. Now, I have been able to look at James Madison's notes on the Constitutional Convention, and it's very, very well documented where he is actually looking at the hashing out of the three-fifths compromise. He talks mm -hmm. specifically about the Electoral College and says, you know, it would be my wish that it would be just one man, one vote, but because of the situation of Southern slavery, that's not gonna work, so we're gonna have to do something else, all right? What I see in there is not, um, this is really, really important to me as a black woman. Yeah. If I just see, okay, three-fifths compromise, you know, and, and here, okay, yeah, they didn't think of you as fully human, you know, that makes a certain very negative mm -hmm. impression on me that's very of different yes. from digging into Madison's notes and looking at the strong passions around that, the yes. debates, the, the fact that many did not want to compromise with the slave owning South. They did not want to. That wow. tells me that there was disagreement, mm -hmm. right? And that mm -hmm. they were really trying to figure out how to keep, how to keep things together to establish 
the country and they didn't. Sometimes you have to make compromises you don't agree with them, mm, right? Mm, mm. But it's also important that we didn't stay there, right? Mm -hmm. That there has actually been progress. We are not where we need to be yet. We will, you know, the idea is making a more perfect union and to continue to try to make a more perfect union. That, see so, that, yes, yeah, so, so the, the word that you used, used just used right now, uh, Dr. Dr. Barham, which was the word progress, um, I've heard um, a lot of um, a lot of people on the left or, or liberals who who will say that a classical education is actually the way forward because it's what could lead to progress and and this is how so just to tell you a little bit of my own journey right coming in my um, introduction to the classics was through of of all things a uh, a Marxist right who and, and I know you've heard of, of Gramsci. Uh, who says this is the kind of education that our children need, talking about what most people would consider a very conservative education, is what they need in order for progress to actually happen. It sounds very counterintuitive, um, but at, at that's I, I find that interesting because you don't, it's not a very popular argument that you hear today, but I think it's actually a very strong one, given how the conversation that we're talking about that extends all the way to antiquity uh, is one of inquiry, one of asking difficult questions, not taking anything for granted, sometimes doing things pretty radical, radically in terms of not finding a home in your current culture or political regime, but always speaking out, such as Socrates being the gadfly, ultimately being murdered by the polis of Athens. But um, I don't know. Maybe that maybe that's not the full picture, um, and I don't know if you would agree with that statement or if you find some flaws with it. I'm again very open to your wisdom, since you've studied this uh, for much longer. I would say. Yeah. So so actually, um, just before I came to my position here at yes. the University of Virginia, I was for eighteen years in New Orleans at Loyola University. Ah, yes. There, for a good portion of that time, I was the director of the Social Justice Scholars Program. Great. Right? It doesn't get much more progressive than the Social <laughs> Justice right. Scholars Program, right? Wow. Um, yes. However, I brought to that my own particular approach. Okay. So for a number of years, um, I felt vaguely dissatisfied because the, the students were required to do a number of hours of community service and, you know, reflect on that service. But I was dissatisfied intellectually. I felt, but we're not studying what justice is. We're not studying the, the whole conversation, mm. you know, going back to antiquity and into the present. So how yes. can we really know what justice is, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's just kind of people's reactions to what they don't like. Yes. And so um, toward the end of my time there, I put together four great books-based seminars. Wow that led the students through these questions about what is justice, yes. what is democracy, what is citizenship. So this is a group of very progressive, very liberal students. But I would argue there, again, in order to be able to do your work well, you need to know what have great thinkers said about what is justice. And we mm -hmm. had some really good conversations, you know, basic things like, is inequality bad? Yes. And the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible. But when you start really digging into mm -hmm. it, and I start asking a number of kind of Socratic questions, okay, so would we be better off as a society if everyone was exactly equal and had the exact same thing? Once you start getting into it, and you start thinking about human nature, the mm -hmm. nature of motivation, you know, why would we ever want to work particularly hard you know as you start asking some questions the student said hmm okay now that i think about it that way okay so it's not inequality that's the problem it's inequality on the basis of what mm -hmm. you know so that there are some legitimate and even socially helpful forms of inequality and then there are some injurious mm -hmm. and unjust mm -hmm. forms of inequality so we've, we've we've already this is a group of liberal and progressive students but by going back into some of that classic literature yes. and that this generation's long conversation, 
we have a much more fine-grained understanding, mm -hmm. you know, of what is actually going on. Wonderful. In fact, I like to point out a lot to my, my own students and sometimes parents who ask me these questions that um, I can't really point at uh, books in the canon or the classics that agree with each other. I mean, it's just, it's more of a tradition of disagreement than it is this monolithic point of view of what the world should be like. And that's why I think that in a way it really educates our children into asking tough questions and not taking anything for granted, which can sound pretty radical and rebellious uh, if we were to only to revisit the texts in, in this approach, which I find to be <clears throat> many times the most condu conducive to great conversations in the classroom. So, uh, the, Dr. Parham, when people say the classics are only for white people, would you agree or disagree with that? How would you um, reshape that conversation to address that accusation? Mm. I would say mm -hmm. that there has been an experience, at least in this country, mm -hmm. where the classics have seemed to be more for elite students mm -hmm. and largely white mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. However, that is a particular historical context that has not always been true. Right. Okay. So for instance, the book that um, Anika Prather and I are writing together, where we look at the black intellectual tradition, yes. one of the things that is very notable there is that post-emancipation, many, many black intellectuals, they wanted this classical education. Really, that was education. Yes. So if you're going to get an education, the idea is you're getting a classical education. Mm -hmm. And they really worked against the idea that um, some were trying to push them into of a, a largely or only industrial education. Yes. You know, Anna Julia Cooper, W.E.B. Du Bois said, no, that's not what we need. That's not what we want. We need our young people to have the finest training to be able to lead. Mm -hmm. And so again, it comes back to what I say when I hear these things. Okay, I'm speaking with someone who does not have a good historical grounding mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. black people fought very hard to keep a classical education and to gain access to a classical education. Mm -hmm. And they did not like the idea that they were being railroaded into only industrial education. This is, you know, this is all you can do. And there's nothing wrong with working in industry. So I don't want yes, anyone to correct. take that away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to kind of channel a whole people mainly into manual labor, you know, suggests that our brains are not just as good as anyone else's. Um, <laughs> and so, yes. again, certainly it's not only for white people. Mm -hmm. Now, it has been constructed that way mm -hmm. in some cases, but that is a lie. Mm -hmm. It is not only for white people. And there have been plenty of non-white people across the centuries who have engaged in this conversation and have been classically trained. That's an awesome, awesome response. Um, so it, it, if I could summarize it and tell me if I got this correctly, is you would point out that it is a, an, a historical accent that uh, accident, excuse me, that might have or does have some racist roots to it or racist beginnings, but that the um, the canon and the classics themselves, as mentioned earlier, uh, don't have any intrinsic rule or a rubric by which new voices cannot be added to it, but it's always growing and changing and transforming itself as we move forward into the future. It is. Um, so going back to say 700 to about 1400, mm -hmm. um, there was a really flourishing um, Arabic science movement. Oh, yes. Beautiful. Where you had thinkers who were very much in conversation yes. with the Greeks. And, you know, so they didn't see a problem with it. They didn't think, oh, well, this is only <laughs> for white people. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. there's, no, that mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense. But again, it comes down to not knowing the history. And I don't say that in a way to be mean or blame people. Correct. It's just we have not been trained. Um, but I also think we haven't been trained because we haven't been doing classical education. That's right. Right? That's right. And we we had this important step of, of really um, valorizing ethnic studies, which is important, but I think we have to come back to put many of those writers in conversation with the center of the canon and kind of 
really have this talk about what the canon is um, and the fact that there is room for other voices. And then if we educate that way, yes, yes, then I guarantee from antiquity all the way through to the present day, you will see diverse voices because they're already there. Yes. You don't have to throw them in or shove them in. They're already <laughs> there. Beautiful, beautiful. And and yes, I mean, um, I remember studying Al-Kindi and Al-Ghazali and uh, all these Muslim, Muslim philosophers. And in fact, just to uh, point out to our viewers real fast, uh, there is such a thing as Muslim classical education and or Jewish classical education or right. Um, Latin American classics. There is such a thing. And um, in fact, I love uh, my Pablo Neruda and Borges, and I love my Latin American classics. Um, so that's that's just beautiful, the variety and the richness of it. And it's it's a tragedy that um, up to this point, at least cultural, culturally, a, a historical accident or having racist beginnings, that it's been um, kind of the, the privilege of a small elite, as you pointed out. And what we're trying to do is bring this to the people to the people's attention because it's really a pearl of a great price that ought to belong to everyone. I just really quickly before I ask you my last question, Dr. Parham, because we've we finally made it to the end here. I want to remind our viewers to uh, click that subscribe button, uh, click on the bell so that they get notifications every time we go live or we do uh, put up a video. We're going to be creating some great content. We're going to have some more excellent um, guests like Dr. Parham, who's here with us today. And um, we're also going to be uh, doing some, uh, offering some resources, all for free, ladies and gentlemen. So make sure to follow us on our other uh, social media platforms. So here's my last question, Dr. Parham, for you, and that is: um, there is an argument right now that's become very popular. Um, a, a gentleman of the name of uh, Roosevelt Montes, Dr. Montes, up at Columbia University, has written a book uh, and uh, a wonderful book and he he writes it from the point of view right as a latino coming from uh, the dominican republic and um, he says the the classics and the canon actually uh, have a lot to offer minorities like myself and um, it, it'll do a lot to benefit us and i, I want to know your thoughts on that argument do you think it's a good argument to make um, does it does a classical education really have? Uh, I mean, are the results good where we can actually just persuade people with the data itself and say, look, what else do you want to look at? So, well, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts on that. No, absolutely. So here, um, I guess a couple of case studies. So Frederick Douglass himself, mm. um, oh, yes. he found the Colombian order um, as a young boy, which was filled with classic text and, you know, just wonderful rhetoric in terms of great speeches. And that is how he began to train himself to read and to be the great orator that he became. Wonderful. When he was learning this, when he was learning how to read, you see in his narrative, he talks about how this absolutely opened up his mind and his spirit. It was absolutely freeing to him. And for racial minorities and those who have been marginalized, this, this theme, and the, the great conversation about freedom and liberation is absolutely key. And you mm. see that in Douglas, the sense of being mentally freed, even though he was still physically enslaved, mm -hmm. even though he was still physically enslaved, he was mentally being freed wow. by this reading. Another example would be Huey Newton, the Black Panther. We wouldn't tend to think of as being a great proponent of classical education, <laughs> but he, so he, trained himself to read with Plato's Republic. Amazing. It was very long and grueling, but once, you know, he had to try to do it several times. Once he started really understanding it, it was mind blowing. And wow. he has a, a chapter in his book where he talks about um, the brothers on the corner and how he introduced the allegory of the cave to these, you know, just everyday black men hanging on the corner. And he would talk about this allegory of the cave and they said, yeah, you know what? It's like we're in the cave, you know, yeah. and we need to kind of get out and understand the truth of our situation and mm -hmm. how do we free ourselves. Instead of, you know, kind of going along with what people say we are, we need to free our minds, ourselves. 
Amazing. And I think those two cases are very clear. That's amazing. And we didn't even go deep into the idea of how the, the liberal arts or classical education uh, sows a seed for that uh, desire for liberty and casting off oppression and fighting it. I think, oh gosh, that could be a whole nother hour of, of a wonderful interview. Thank you so much, Dr. Parham, for being with us here today. It's such an honor to have um, an, an intellect like you here, a luminary, I would say. It's impressive. I am so, uh, again, I learned so much from you and I, and I know our viewers feel the same way. So I would love to extend an invitation for you to come back sometime in the future. We'll stay in contact. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and transition to our exit uh, page. Please stay with me and then uh, we'll uh, get to meet a little bit afterwards. Is that okay? That sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, Dr. Parham. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being a part of this wonderful live stream. Um, we are always so honored to have such great people uh, be a part of this renewal movement and supporting our Heritage Classical Academy dream of offering a free K-12 classical education to the children of Houston. Uh, once again, I just want to remind our viewers that uh, you support us simply by following us, subscribing, uh, finding us on all the other social media platforms that we are on. You can see up on the page those uh, our Twitter handle, our Facebook and Instagram handles as well, and our website at the bottom of the page, heritageclassicalhouston.org. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for viewing. We are going to put the links to uh, Dr. Parham's book up on our YouTube and Twitter, as well as her website, so you can follow her, uh, all the interesting work that she's doing, the books that she's writing, and uh, we hope to get a few buyers of her book uh, through this uh, video live stream. Once again, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you again uh, to our next show, which is going to be, as you can see up on the screen, uh, our third series on racism and the classics, W.E.B. Du Bois and classical education with author Dr. David Witham.